Good afternoon, everyone. We'll uh, get, hit the noon hour here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all very much for coming out and attending this presentation, um, sponsored by Hydronics Industrial Alliance, on um, uh, air cooled versus water cooled for HVAC applications. Um, specifically, some tools to help you select the right cooling system uh, for your application. Part of the agenda, we're going to have it broken down with a total of uh, at least three or four speakers. We'll see. Uh, my name is Gary Stoffer, I'm a sales engineer with SPX Cooling Technologies. Um, and we've also got uh, Mark and Greg to talk about some of the software tools um, and evaluating air cool versus water cool. And then uh, finally, a uh, case study um, on the Western U.S. data center. So go ahead and get started. Um, so understanding the differences on the fundamentals. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, as I said, my name is Gary Stopper, sales engineer with SPX Cooling Technology. Uh, I've been uh, working for them for almost 17 years now. I have quite a variety of roles within the company. Um, I've worked with mechanical components systems, uh, technical services, as well as applications engineer. Of course, here most recently as an outside sales engineer. Um, got some uh, industrial experience uh, before that, and uh, have been an active member of both uh, ASHRAE and ASME. So today we really want to take a look at what is the best system, uh, what makes sense for you uh, between air cooled and water cooled. So let's just start out and talk a little bit about the advantages. So air cooled, um, typically air cooled systems, packaged units. Um, so low capital cost, you know, they come ready to be uh, uh, plugged into the system and you're, you get them hooked up and ready to go. Pretty simple ease of use, um, very easy to maintain, uh, so you have relatively low maintenance cost with an air-cooled system. And a lot of that has to deal with the fact that with an air-cooled system, you're not having to deal with water. So you don't have water treatment, you don't have on-site water usage, um, you don't have to worry about piping and leak so much uh, with that air, uh, with that uh, air cool system, you know, you've got just your uh, your process flow through that air cool unit. But when you take a look at the water cool advantages, um, you want to take a look at what the um, efficiency of what water cool brings you. Um, you really want to take a look at that evaluated cost and what the overall energy use is. So maybe not even that energy use just at your local site, but also keep in mind um, the other factors, you know, as you're using that higher electrical cost, you know, you want to evaluate also back to uh, the point of generation and stuff as well. Water cool also brings a really good advantage from the overall capacity. Um, you know, we're able, water cool systems are able to cool to the wet wall temperature, not your dry bulb. Um, you're able with a water cooled system, it's a lot more uh, steady state and provides a good constant comfort and a lot more ease of a, a nice steady control. You don't have as much fluctuation um, really to a wet bulb as you do a dry bulb as a dry bulb varies more throughout the day. Uh, also, noise maintenance time. Air cooled systems typically have units uh, with a lot of fans and so that's a lot to maintain. Uh, with a water cooled system, Unit size is going to be a little bit bigger. There's going to be fewer fans. And so, um, like I said, less maintenance time because you're dealing with fewer mechanical equipment pieces. Water cool system as a whole, um, you're able to get much more cooling out of that same footprint or even a much smaller footprint as you would the air cooled. So, your footprint of what the water cooled system has to take up. And then ultimately, you want to look at the total water usage. So not just your on-site water usage, but also your point of generation of your electrical energy and power. So as we move forward, we can do a little bit of a comparison here. So water-cooled systems, you can see, goes from very small all the way up to pretty good size. You know, we started talking a 3,000 ton system, that's going to be quite large. Most of the time, your air-cooled systems are going to be more compared on the smaller side. Um, you know, it was two, three hundred tons. Now we're looking at air cooled systems that are five hundred tons, maybe a thousand tons, uh, where uh, air cooled systems are being applied. 
That air cooled is going to have that lower upfront cost, but again, it's ultimately going to be less efficient at rejecting that heat. And that there then together uh, limits what their overall capacity uh, of what you can do. Where a water cooled system, again, uh, can grow to be much larger. When you take and you look at the air cooled systems, you're just within a, a day from uh, a day cycle, you're cooling to the dry bulb with an air cooled system. So you're going to have much more fluctuation, more variance throughout the day um, that that air cooled system. Uh, so your control capability of that air cooled system uh, has to be greater to be able to handle the differences and variances. That also is true throughout the year. Um, you're going to have a much um, so, uh, I happen to be uh, from Kansas City. Well, we see days in the summertime where we see 9,500 degree ambient temperatures. It's hard to cool, um, to keep your system cool on a 95 degree day with an air cooled system. But at the same time, you have much fluctuations. Uh, we've had temperatures here this last month where we've seen single digit temperature. Again, a greater fluctuation. Uh, the wet bulb, though, is a much more steadier. So if you have a water-cooled system, it's going to be much more stable. You're going to allow uh, to cool below that dry bulb temperature on your peak design days. And so evaluating that and the overall stability of the system, water-cooled can make a lot of sense uh, from the evaluation standpoint. Of the systems of, um, of cooling products, so looking at water-cooled systems, um, there's a lot of different uh, options that you have. Uh, so we've got a whole list, uh, maybe shows up a little bit small here, um, but we'll kind of start at the top there. Um, traditional open circuit tower um, with a tie to a, a killer condenser loop. Um, so that's going to be your lowest cost, um, but it does have a fair amount of energy use. Um, but you, with an open system like that, you're always going to be in evaporation. There's no dry capacity. But there's lots of other options. You can uh, start getting into the hybrid systems, like a closed circuit fluid cooler, um, where you've got a coil. So you, you're, um, you're recirculating, you have a recirculating loop along with a coil product. Uh, so there you start to have um, a little bit more increased first cost when you're able to drop that energy use um, with that uh, hybrid system. Um, you can also do uh, maybe for some small equipment, a hybrid counterflow system. Uh, there, the overall first cost of those units are very well stacked and compact, and so you can have a little bit lower first cost versus uh, maybe that cross flow system. Um, but notice that you don't have very much dry capacity, even though you have a coil uh, unit uh, within that uh, particular um, piece of equipment. But then you can start to jump up to units that are fluid coolers that have a coil only. Um, again, you're, you don't have any of that uh, fill media that does that evaporative cooling portion for you. And so you're going to have increased cost. Those coils are bigger. Um, it, but your, your energy starts to go up when you start uh, trying to operate those. You do have a little bit more dry capacity, uh, but that's kind of the middle of the road. Then you can get into more expensive coils that increase your surface area. Um, with a, a closed circuit unit that is fit coil only. Um, obviously your first cost keeps getting larger, um, but it's very efficient from an energy standpoint, but you're also starting to increase your overall dry capacity. Then you have options of adiabatic units. Adiabatic units are basically a dry cooler, but then you have those uh, the ability to pre-cool the air that crosses over. So you're going to have a little bit of water usage with those, uh, but you start talking more of those units, more of those fans. Um, you're going to have maybe more first cost equipment uh, there, um, and you're going to have higher energy consumption, but your dry capacity goes up. And then finally, strictly using it just a dry tower. Um, again, much uh, they require more units, higher first cost, um, higher energy consumption, but your dry capacity, you don't, you're not using any water. So there's a whole wide range of your cooling tower uh, that you have there. And so um, it all, all depends on what your needs are um, for your very dry operation goals, whether you're trying to save on water, whether you're trying to save on water treatment, um, whether you're worried about adding the basin freeze during wintertime operation conditions. 
And then also having that ability of uh, redundancy or flexibility within your operating. So, I mean, you, as you add coil surface area, you're going to get increased capacity, um, but it does require more airflow for that dry capacity. And so um, that coil surface area, it does come at a cost. But now let's talk a little bit more about the water usage side in the evaporative cooling. So we have, uh, you're going to evaporate water off. Um, and so that's uh, typically, you know, 1% of what uh, your heat load is, um, is traditionally kind of the knowledge. And so as you evaporate that water off, you see the different cylinders here on the chart. And uh, the more water you evaporate off, the more total dissolved solids you're going to have in that. Um, but we have to balance that out. So you're evaporating water off, uh, but to get rid of those solids, you have to blow down the system uh, so that you maintain what's called cycles of concentration. Cycles of concentration is basically how many times you could reuse that water. Um, and so you have to keep in mind based upon what your tower construction is, is how high you can take your cycles of concentration what's actually in your water quality, um, what's limiting it. Is it chlorides? Is it the amount of calcium? Uh, things that are, that are making up your full dissolved solids. So you basically have to balance that overall cycles of concentration because you've got your makeup water which is usually um, fairly low uh, total dissolved solids and then as you evaporate that water off how many cycles of concentration you want to take. So it's, it's just a, a mass balance equation uh, within your system that you need to take a look at. So this next slide, um, we're going to take an example look at a, a 500 ton system here. So um, nominal conditions, uh, a 10 uh, degree range at uh, 95, 85, 78. Um, drift, uh, that's any entrapped water that gets into the airflow and escapes out of the top of the uh, evaporative cooling tower. So that's going to be fairly minimal. Um, and then you've got uh, evaporation rate um, in this example, supposed to be 12, almost 13 gallons per minute um, that you're using um, for evaporation. As you can see, the drift rate um, at the triple O two percent is very small, um, less than half a gallon. But then your blow down, um, it all depends on where you want to be able to operate your system at from a point of cycles of concentration. So in the chart down there, you can see at two cycles of concentration, which is kind of uh, most manufacturers of evaporative equipment would recommend between two and four cycles of concentration, depending on your material of construction. At two cycles of concentration, you've got 12, almost 13 gallons per minute uh, with that. But if you work with your water quality uh, and, and look at what's in that water and the contents and work with your provider, there's possibilities that we see these days people operating and increasing their cycles of concentration and operating six, seven cycles of concentration. So as you can see, you're able to cut it down to almost a sixth uh, of the year of um, from two cycles of concentration to going and operating in six cycles of concentration. There are limits though, and you don't want to go too high with your cycles of concentration because you're going to have kind of a diminishing return on your water usage there from the blow down standpoint. Um, and also, um, if you're running at very high cycles of concentrations, any disruption in water treatment or everything like that could be an upset uh, to your system and could uh, put it in a uh, undesirable um, condition. So there's lots of things that you can do um, to help reduce your blow down. So again, I mentioned working with your local water treater and that water treatment provider. But there's also things you can do to reduce those uh, totally dissolved solids. Um, so you can soften the water. So you may be trying to reduce your amount of calcium uh, that's within the water. Uh, you can use uh, systems like a reverse osmosis system, um, you know, doing the deionization within the water. Or also just adding uh, filtration systems, side filtration, um, that can help pull out that uh, solids out of your water and then that allows you to continue and keep and maintain a good high cycle of concentration. Uh, so those are all particular uh, options. But then um, ultimately though, we want to get back to that comparison of um, looking at the air-cooled system versus a water-cooled system. 
So this is a case study around a 400 ton application in California. Um, so you can see on the chart on the right for this typical application, um, the amount of energy consumption for air cooled for that same 400 ton system, uh, it's more than double what the energy consumption is uh, for that water cooled system. That's that efficiency you get with evaporation cooling. But also you want to take a look at the greenhouse gas emissions because it's directly proportional as well. Um, so for lower greenhouse gas emissions, a water cooled system is going to be much uh, lower on that. Um, because in this particular case study, it's not just your, you're not just comparing your overall um, water usage and the energy consumption. We are also looking at the water usage at the point where that energy is created. And so um, you've got to go back to the power plant as well because when there's a cost of water associated with generating that electricity. And so um, the total water usage, when you start looking at that air-cooled energy system, how much water it actually consumes in this particular case, more water than the water-cooled system, plus the cost of the energy of that water-cooled system on site. Now, that's going to be varied based upon location, what the cost of energy is. Um, you know, it can also be um, dependent upon how much renewable energy uh, is available within the region. But right now, across the country, um, renewables is still a very small portion. Uh, fossil fuels still make up 79% of our energy production here uh, across the United States. So, if you can save that energy going to a water-cooled system, even if you do have fossil fuels, or you do have renewables versus fossil fuels, a higher uh, rate, now those fossil fuels uh, can be reduced more because you're not having to produce as much electricity. You're also able to save on that water usage. So ultimately, you can have uh, a lower, um, you know, a lower green footprint with a water-cooled system and stuff. So you want to take a look at that evaluation. So up to 50% lower uh, annual uh, average energy usage um, with a water-cooled system uh, versus other traditional HVAC systems. And you can ultimately have a lower decrease or a big decrease on the demand on the electrical grid. And no matter whether that is coming from renewables or fossil fuels, um, yes, that evaporative cooling does use more water. Um, but it requires, in many locations, far less than what it is to create that same amount of electricity at the power plant. So it all depends on where you're really looking at on your overall water usage. So from at this point, we want to continue on and uh, dive into more uh, ways on uh, analyzing. So I'll uh, turn it on over to Mark here. Thank you very much. So I'm, we're actually going to uh, tag team uh, this presentation as, as we transition. So I'm going to um, introduce um, also Greg Conniff, um, who's uh, Director of Application Solutions at uh, Williams Comfort Products. Um, and uh, Greg and I will be talking about some of the tools that we've uh, come up with. Because you want to do this, and you want to do this analysis, um, but you really want to do it for the building that you're building and the location you're building in and get right down to, uh, okay, let's, let's make a proper evaluation on that side. And that's, that's what we're going to uh, touch on today. For myself, um, I, work at, uh, I work at Tago, uh, so we're the, we're the pump folks on that side of it. But together, um, everybody that's up here, plus many, many more manufacturers, um, make up the Hydronic Industry Alliance. And these are a, a host of different manufacturing companies, from pumps to valves to coolers to, you know, on and on and on, piping, everybody in between, uh, that uh, is in the business of moving, controlling uh, water on that side of it. So we've, uh, we've been a group, we, we came together many years ago to try to promote the benefits of water, which we truly believe is the most efficient way to transfer uh, BTUs on that side of it. Not only the most efficient way, uh, but also the most uh, uh, environmentally friendly way of doing it. So 
one of the things that, that we have gotten together and done in this side of it is, is develop tools for you to use to evaluate exactly what, um, what's going to be happening in the mechanical room, um, in that system, in that life of the building. How is it going to perform? And make choices very, very early on in the design process um, that can have substantial impacts on the operation, efficiency, longevity, um, resiliency of your, of your building. And listen, buildings are very different, and they have very different um, use cases, uh, but we wanted to take that into account and, and allow you to personalize that side of it. So what are your design goals? It could be very different if you're a university and you're building a new science building that you're planning to have for 20, 30, 40 years, compared to maybe a, a three-story, um, uh, you know, Marriott or, or hotel on that side of it that you're building, you know, for a client to maybe be looking to turn for two years. I mean, all the use cases are very different on that side of it. But what you need to do is you need to take a look at what some of those design goals are. You know, where how does comfort play into it? How does resiliency? How green do I want to be on that side of it? Um, and, and maybe all of those choices are there, and it's a balance. And maybe projects differ on that side of it. What we want to do is really look at the tools to provide, okay, given that, how do you do that balance? How do you look at that side of it? And how do we look at it today? Right now, a lot of it we look at it comes from just the ratings, the AHRI ratings. Right? But not all equipment is included in those ratings. Right? So we talked about some of the ratings for you know chillers and that side of it for water cool, but the energy of the pumps isn't included in those ratings. And some of those pumps are big pumps. Hopefully they're really big pumps and they're green and they're, anyway. Um, but some of those pumps they, they use a lot of energy on that side of it. But on the other side, you know, it may not actually reflect actual conditions. These are these are test protocols that are very standard, and but. They're different for each piece of equipment. Or you may have a, an air-cooled equipment you know, that gets tested at, at, at 80 degrees. But in application, you might want to get down to 73 degrees, a much more you know, comfortable level that you want to go ahead and rate at. That could be a 10% difference in that efficiency. So the ratings don't always produce what the actual results are in the field on that side of it. So what we did is we started to develop um, tools to take into account everything that was missing in those ratings. To make it so you could actually go ahead and see when I put equipment in, not what that equipment rating is, but how that equipment is going to perform in the actual building, in the actual location that I'm putting it into. So we added back in all of the different things that were missing. We added the pumps in, we added the fan horsepower in, we added in the, the loss of uh, you know, the resistance in, in, uh, for refrigerant systems and the lengths of pipes and, and all of that. So now what you can do is we've come up with the best software. It's been, a, it's been out for over 10 years now. We continue to make improvements. We just launched a new version of it that now you can do multiple heat generation sources, a lot of heat pump side of it. But this is the way to go ahead and start from a very early design phase to take a look at how to maximize your goals, whether it be efficiency, whether it be a return on that investment, the sustainability side. But you can take a look at actual system performance, actual installed costs, operating maintenance data, and it's all adjusted for the equipment that you're putting in there, all the parts and pieces that need to go along with it to make it work in a complete system. We use all the hourly weather data. We try to make it really easy in terms of getting started um, on that side of it with pre-configured systems and all that. And the best part is, not the best part, the best part is the data that you get out of it and the conversations you can have with engineers, but it's free. This has been brought to you by a collection of, of us manufacturers that have worked for over 10 years um, to upgrade, test, 
you know, make sure that the data coming out is, is, is accurate and, and resembles actual real world performance on that side of it. Um, and it's free, you can download it at the HIAC um, website, so festhvac.org on that portion of it. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Greg. Greg's gonna do a little, just a, a little demo so you can kind of get a flavor so you can see how you could employ these tools in making better decisions early on in the, early on in the process uh, to really make a big difference on, in your building structure. Thank you, Mark. I'm Greg Hanna, and I'm the Director of Applied Solutions at Williams Comfort Products, but I also wear another hat, which is the Hydronics Industry Alliance. Uh, as Mark mentioned, we've been at this for quite some time, uh, well over 10 years. <clears throat> and what we'd like to do is show you this software, because we think it's pretty slick. So I started out in the consulting engineering business. I've been doing this kind of thing for a long time. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have used energy analysis software like Carrier Hap, Train Trace, Equest? Raise your hand. Okay, great. All right. Gentlemen right here. <laughs> if you're going to evaluate three or four different systems in a typical building using whatever you use, how long would it take you? Um, I don't think the building is, but yeah, it probably takes several hours, maybe a couple of days. Couple of days, yeah, all right. <clears throat> How'd you like to do it in a couple of hours? Hmm. Huh? Would you like that? Okay. <laughs> and here's the deal you can charge the same price. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so what we've created here is what we think <clears throat> is a tool that can be done very quickly and easily and will give you, in our opinion, um, answers that are just as good as you're getting out of this more complicated software. I'm not saying that the other software is not good. We're not trying to sell anything here. The software is free, right? We're trying to just help you. Do your job quicker, better, and make more money. How many of you like to make money in this room, right? <laughs> That's what we're trying to do is help you make more money. Okay. <clears throat> so. Here's an example of some of the uh, input here. I'll, I'll go through real quickly here because I want to get into the actual demo, okay? So we're just gonna make a flat statement here that water cooled is 35% more efficient than air cooled. And we're gonna show you a real world example. It's a little bit, um, what should I say, um, a little bit different. This is the old ASHRAE headquarters building in Atlanta. They have since moved into a new facility. I've been to that building. <coughs> Talk to the folks now. What's really interesting about this building is that two different HVAC systems. The first floor is an air cooled ERF, and the second floor is a water cooled <clears throat> geothermal heat pump system. What's really interesting about this building is that the two systems were actually metered in terms of the energy consumption, electrical energy consumption. Separate electrical meters. It's one of the few jobs that we can find that actually have meters on the two different HVAC systems. Okay. So that's the building. Those are the systems. This is the energy consumption. This was uh, done over about a, a four-year period. The blue is the water-cooled system, and the red is the air-cooled system. The difference is about 40% roughly, okay, between the two systems. Now, you would expect the geothermal system to be more efficient because it's heat sink you're rejecting heat to should be at a lower temperature, right? Than the air cooled system. Would make sense to me. This is what actually goes on there. Here's what's really interesting. Now, I'm not going to say that the geothermal system is undersized, but <clears throat> the temperatures that it experiences during the cooling season are higher than you might expect in a system that was designed with a larger well field. Interestingly enough, the average temperature of the two heat sinks that you're rejecting to is the same. The ground, 79 degrees versus the air, 79 degrees. So the difference in energy consumption is not the difference in the temperature of the heat sinks that you're rejecting heat to. It's something else. <clears throat> now what's that got to do with water cooled cooling towers? <laughs> Well, we can do a little adjustment here. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, if you look at the weather data for Atlanta, 
the average dry bulb temperature in the cooling season is 79, and the average wet bulb is 70. If we design our cooling tower to an approach of 9 or 10 degrees, that says that you're going to size it at 79 degrees. So the cooling tower would have given us roughly the same performance energy-wise as the ground because it's the same temperature. Everybody buy that? Okay. Now the cooling tower is going to have some more energy to something because you have dams and pumps and stuff. Okay. You run through the numbers. Um, our numbers say that <clears throat> down at the bottom, the increase in energy consumption for the cooling tower versus the geothermal is only 1.5%. I didn't account for the increase in energy consumption of the geothermal for the pump to push all that water through the well field. Who's going to call it? Okay? So, in general, we go back to here, 41% difference. We're going to say that in round numbers, if we'd had a cooling tower, it would have been 40% more efficient than the air cool system. Anybody buy that? Anybody want to disagree with me? Okay. All right. So this is a real-world example. This is not theoretical stuff. This is real-world stuff. <clears throat> and I'm not going to get into this, but <clears throat> there was also a difference on the heating system as well between the two systems. Um, what's really interesting is that if you look at the difference in the published uh, efficiencies, AHRI efficiencies, that's the kind of orange bars on the right versus the real world. There's a huge difference between the two. Interestingly, our VRF systems in the field perform to about half of the published efficiencies. I'm not going to get into that, but nevertheless, it's the actual case. Um, all this data is available. It was actually published in a couple of articles in the Ashley Journal. So we're not pulling any air, any numbers out of the air here. This is actual data that exists. Okay, so let me jump back to what we want to do is show you a little bit about our tool. That's the Building Efficiency System Tool. Again, um, it's available on our website, the High Ground Industry Alliance. Just type in that, go to our uh, homepage, and you can download the software. Okay. Here's what we tried to do. We tried to make this as easy as possible and as quick as possible. <coughs> Back to, this gentleman said it would take him a couple of days to evaluate four different systems. Right. I'm saying you can do it in less than two hours. So I'll just show you how we can do this. First thing you have to tell us is where you're located so we can get the right weather data. We have weather data now from North America, <clears throat> about a mm, thousand different locations. The other thing is to simplify this and speed things up, we model the building as a cube length, width, and height. We're not interested in the building, we're interested in the HVAC system. So let's say this is 300 feet by 100 feet, and let's say it's six floors. Now to speed the process up for you, we have some typical building types in which we have configured, we're going to say the most common HVAC systems that you might see in that particular type of building. So here's an apartment. Lower left, system one is actually an air-cooled fan coil. System two is a DX system. System three is a water-cooled heat pump. And system four is an air-cooled VRF. Upper left-hand corner shows you the uh, <coughs> differences in energy consumption, annual energy consumption of the four different systems. Uh, upper right-hand corner shows you the life cycle cost. Lower left-hand corner is the uh, dollars and cents in terms of first cost and payback. Go here. This is our advanced system tab. And by the way, we have another session tomorrow at 3.30. We'll go into more detail of the software. Don't have a lot of time today. I just want to show you a little bit like how you would use it. Okay, we regurgitate the, the data you added in the simple wizard locations. So you get the right weather data. Here's the building's dimensions. And if you tell us where you're located, we can also tell you the average energy cost for the state that you're located in. We get this data from the Department of Energy, the EI Energy Information Administration. So this is the average cost of these utilities in each state that you then tell us that you're located in. Okay? The other thing we did 
If you don't have any information in on the load of the building, we've estimated some BTUs per square foot here for heating and cooling, as an example. You can change that if you want. Um, if you've done your own loads, fine. Um, but just to get you started, we've got some numbers here that we think are fairly reasonable. All right. So here is the energy cost tab. This is what you saw earlier. Those are the four different systems. Life cycle cost, there's the life cycle cost of the four different systems. Let's go back and change something. Let's say that you don't like what we did as the typical system. So I'm still going to do a fan coil. But I'm going to do a water cool, and oh, by the way, I'm going to make this super efficient. I'm going to do a two pipe integrated piping. So we have <clears throat> less pipe. Now we're going to go back and look at the energy costs. Now that water cool fan coil is even more efficient. So again, the two um, water cooled systems are significantly more efficient than the air cooled systems. And the two guys on the right, kind of the ASHRAE building. So it looks like it's, you know, 30 to 40 percent more efficient. So, back to the numbers that we said before. That water cooled system is going to be more efficient. At least 30 to 40, sometimes 50% more efficient. All right, where's my gentleman? Did it take me two hours to do that? What did it take me? Five minutes? Ooh. But remember, you're going to bill them for two days, right? <laughs> and you can print all this out. Print to a PDF, we go to Excel. So if you want to <clears throat> do this to Excel, put your logo on it, you know, make it look nice and you know, charge you more money, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay. Any questions here? Can you display the different systems that are available to select again? Oh sh absolutely. Really good questions. Okay. Here's what we've done. Here are the basic systems that are available under the pre-configuration. As an example here, if you do a heat pump, we've got every type of heat pump known to man. We've got water to air, air to water, water to water, we got geothermal, we got closed loop, standing columns, is on and off. <laughs> okay? So typically what I do is I pick the system if I'm doing, you know, three or four different systems. I'll use the wizard to get me close, and then I'll go in and make changes. I don't have time to do that today. We'll talk about that. Tomorrow. Once you do a change, here's the system screen, and the way this works, at the bottom lower left are your heating and cooling sources, or whatever system you're trying to configure, okay? There's your heating source, there's the cooling source. In the middle are your distribution systems, pipe, um, and ductwork, and on the right-hand side are all the terminal. So this kind of looks a little like um, the carrier apps and and the frame traces, because you have drop-down menus, it's just that what they do is each one of these has its own screen. So you go through 20 or 30 screens. We could do this all in what, maybe eight or 10 drop-downs, and still got the same choices, but it's a lot quicker, okay? Does that make any sense? Okay. Yes. Hey, is this plan being possible to be using outside USA? Can you use it outside the USA? You're talking about the weather data? Yes. Yes, okay. So back to here. Um, we have weather data for North America, Canada, Mexico, and the US. We don't have any weather data for outside North America. But can I able to input the data? Say that again? Can I input the data? No, you cannot input. Um, I've done a number of these analysis for places around the world. Um, you can generally find a location in the U.S. that pretty much mimics locations around the world. Okay, you're going to get close. Thank you. Close enough. What you're trying to do here is help your customer get started in making some reasonably intelligent decisions. You're not having to spend days and days and hours and hours and you know. This helps you narrow down your choices here. Yeah, one of the things we were really looking at is trying to give you a tool to have a discussion with that design team very early on in the design process before a system type was chosen. So you could go ahead and have a very good conversation about some of those goals and types of options and systems that are available to meet those before you had to 
do a lot of, you know, the, the carrier, the train trace, and all that side of it, which is usually done later in the project when, when you're actually getting paid for it. Right? This is a tool that allows you to do some of this up front. And, and, and look at the big difference between going, do I want a, you know, a, 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 a radiant type system, a hydronic system, or do I want to put a VRF system in? What are the pluses? What are the minuses? And, and you can have that conversation and do it very, very quickly in that portion of it. Um, and that's really, it's not a substitute for the big programs, uh, but it's, it's a hell of a lot better than a box model at the very early stage of, of what you're looking at to, to, uh, to do some evaluation. And, 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 uh, and to improve the discussions around some of the trade-offs of, of different types of systems and, and what you get out of it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can you be clear in the, in the software, like the overall cost of those water systems, like uh, water treatment cost, and kind of like the whole LCCA, big picture? Okay. Um, we have time, so I'll answer the question. I'll try to do it as simply as possible. Okay. One of the other things that we've included in the software that really none of the other guys have, and in my opinion is the biggest advantage or biggest help, helpfulness in the software, we have a little button here called Estimate. So we will give you an estimated first cost, maintenance cost, and replacement cost of the system that you pre-configured over here. You have to use the, the pre-configured configuration wizard. You can't do it from the system screen. So once you do that, then we'll give you Estimated first cost, maintenance cost, and replacement cost. Okay. The first cost information we got from actual contractors, um, roughly 50 contractors around the country, um, and we asked them to actually give us dollar per square foot numbers for these different systems. That's a difficult thing to do because the contractors, that's their proprietary information, right? Um, Rick and I were shocked. <laughs> This is the truth. The contractor sent us his Excel spreadsheet. He had 250 jobs on a sheet with all the different systems and all the different prices. And we assured him that we would not, you know, give that to somebody else. So we feel these are pretty good numbers. Um, maintenance costs, we asked the contractors if they could help us with that. We didn't get quite as much information out of that. Um, I found some really good information on maintenance costs of all these different systems. Um, this was a few years ago, so we feel pretty good about that. Replacement cost, um, percent of first cost and the interval of replacement really comes from hash rate data. So this is an accumulation of different sources. So back to if it's an air-cooled system versus a water-cooled system, we're going to have some maintenance data in there, but if you have better maintenance cost data, you're more than happy. Obviously, you can update this to whatever you want. All these fields are are user, are, are user changeable, okay? But when you go to the life cycle cost, we've included the first cost here, okay? And we've also included the annual energy and maintenance cost. So it's a true life cycle cost. I'm not aware of the other softwares being able to do that for you up front. Um, you could certainly enter all that data, but this is really difficult data to get a hold of if you're not a contractor and doing this every day. Yes, sir. Is this geographically normalized? You know, yes. doing, doing this in, uh, you know, yes. Montana is going to be different than New York City. Correct, and I live in Montana, by the way. <laughs> 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 yes, we had data from all across the country. We had New York City, we had Memphis, Tennessee, and so we actually, this was really cool. <laughs> this is really interesting. So we had all these dollar per square foot numbers, you know, from all over, right? <laughs> so. I tried to do a statistical analysis. I'm a dumb engineer, so I always have to think of bringing things back to numbers. Okay. We set up a base system, which happened to be heat pumps. We said, okay, that's the base cost. And then what's the difference percentage-wise from that base system on all these others in every geographical area? And I was shocked. It came out the same. The difference between that heat pump system percentage-wise and these other systems was the same, independent of the geography, which is what I had hoped, right? So when we see here low, medium, and high, high is New York City, low is where I live, and then you got medium, maybe I don't know, right? So it's, it gives you a relative uh, difference in cost, okay? That's all we're trying to do is help you out with that. Thank you.
I'll, I'll add one one thing too. This, this, we don't mind the information. You don't have to put a, a, a project in there. But when you start changing things, especially if you change, uh, you can change any of those numbers for install cost per square foot, etc. The idea being to find your job and then you go ask the contractor what does it cost to do this. You, you can put it in there. That top line that it says fan coil water cool, you can type in there and it says I put in Kalispell, Montana cost or something. Or you said I I changed it to a water cool tower. You no, know, that's there. But other stuff you did, you change a preference, we call it a preference for you. If you change any of that, there's a hundred things you can change. Make some notes, because as soon as you close it, it's gone unless you save it on your computer. Could you somehow in a future update of this somehow flag that with some things that change from the base? Uh, change the color of that something and say that this is not okay. Free, free, free. What happened for something? <laughs> well, <laughs> we, do, we do do that, so if you make a change, that field is now moved out. If I go in here and I change something, okay? It changes the color to something else. See that blue? So that tells you we made a change from our assumption. Yes, to answer your question. Okay. 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 We're running out of time. We're running out of time, Ken Folks. We got to get our other mark up here. Okay. Say that again. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. Hold on. There it is. Here, here's the specific website, but if you go in, just type in Hydronics Industry Alliance in, into your search engine, it will come up and say HIA. Once you get to the home page, then just scroll down and it will give you a link to download the software. Okay. You can find it through our app on commercial.org.com. Also, our various uh, company websites. Uh, Mark Takel, ourselves, at, at uh, Williams and Water Furnace, you go on to their pages and they'll have links that go back to our hydraulics industry. Yeah, I don't know if that like Dan's asked for functionality. Uh, right there. <laughs> when I demonstrate my company software, I'm not so lucky to have questions like that. So. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I'm Mark Viper, I'm with Disbix Fully Technologies, going on 31 years. I've had various roles. Uh, Secretary of the Cooling uh, Tower Club here at Ashray, uh, lead AP, so um, I've been around the block, I guess. Um, so a couple of things we'll talk about today in the, in the remaining time. Basically just talk about how data centers, how they're using the old energy profile and what they're doing with modern design. You know, we want to look briefly at a case study relative to the data center. So to set the table though, before we begin, we just want to look at, you know, the data center folks, we're all familiar with the large players. Um, what are they doing? What are they doing to push the design? Um, they certainly have a wealth of resources that most other, other data centers don't have. They've got uh, facilities that have a lot of redundancy, have a lot of speed and efficiency that others cannot match. Uh, but they are certainly pushing the design forward that, that one would assume would be trickling down to the other, uh, other data center folks in the, in the future. So if we look at just a few examples, the um, big thing that everyone's racing towards is carbon neutrality. Um, in the case of Apple, they're committed to be 100% carbon neutral by 2030, and they're, they're pushing a lot of that to their, to their suppliers. Amazon, very energy conscious as well. Um, they're committed to be net zero by 2040, and they've moved towards much more renewable energy um, as far as their energy source. It went from 42% in 2019 up to 65% in 2020. Um, they've got orders for over 200,000 electric vehicles. And then their uh, AWS, their data center division, is uh, very efficient as well. They're roughly 3.6 times more efficient than other average data centers. And that's attributable to more efficient servers, more efficient data center, uh, as well as just reduced consumption. Uh, just a few more examples. If you look at Google in 2017, they became the first to match 100% of electricity consumption with renewable energy. 
Um, their goal is to be carbon neutral by 2030, and they're even employing artificial intelligence to monitor and manage servers and facilities. Uh, Microsoft, they have a vision referred to as 100 and 100 zero. That by 2030, they'll have 100% of their electricity consumption, 100% of the time matched by zero carbon energy. What's unique about Microsoft is that they are acknowledging the limits of the local grid, how energy is produced, so they're focusing more on how they, pur how they uh, purchase their energy. Now, if we look at some key uh, performance indicators in the data center world, uh, this is the one that I certainly was familiar with. Uh, hopefully, many of you have heard of this, but the PUE, the power usage effectiveness, that basically is the total energy used by the data center against the energy employed to power the IT equipment. And if you look at some examples here, most average data centers are roughly 1.8 PUE, but Facebook has AWS, they're in the neighborhood of 1.1 to 1.2. The next one is carbon usage effectiveness. So this takes that previous one a step further and looks at the CO2 emissions that are produced relative to the energy consumption of the IT equipment. And it's further defined by taking your carbon dioxide emissions factor by your power usage factor. And the last one that's fairly relative uh, you know, to today's discussion is our water usage effectiveness. So this is an indicator defined as the ratio between the water that's consumed. Uh, typically, cooling towers are certainly play a role in that, as well as other water consuming equipment relative to the energy consumption. Um, Facebook, I want to report this number, and they're at 0.35 liters per kilowatt hour. Now, if we look at the energy uh, consumption of energy source, this is as of 2020. Um, and Gary alluded to this that, you know, unfortunately, we're only at, we've only got 12% um, of renewable energy sources as of 2020. So, you know, I think the country's made a lot of strides in the last decade to increase our amount of renewable energy sources. But unfortunately, we're still at a very high 7 9% of fossil fuel. And so when we look at that relative to data centers, um, they are all trying to be very energy efficient. Um, they're under a lot of, I guess, demands and expectations from, from the world to be very efficient. And so unfortunately, though, when they go to get renewable energy, there's only so much of this pie to go around. And that's the important thing today is if there's only so much available then because this does come up in the uh, decarbonization discussion as well, that it's great to be all electric to go towards um, zero fossil fuel usage, but you have to have that electricity available, and then that electricity that's provided to you, of course, needs to be renewable as well to make an impact um, to, that, to that CO2 emissions. And so important to, to look at it from a holistic standpoint. So if you're a data center and you're consuming one to three percent of the electricity demand globally, you just want to evaluate where you're getting your, your power and how much water is that, is that uh, system uh, using. So basically, the premise that we're you know, providing here is that cutting down the energy used at the uh, power plant can actually save water overall. Which that would lead us to a data center case study. Um, the South looked at three different um, Cities in the U.S., Denver, Phoenix, and L.A., fairly similar to, uh, to Las Vegas from a regional standpoint. And they looked at what the water usage and the power consumption was the regional power availability. How would that play into their system? And the authors recognized you know, the efficiency of water cooled. They also wanted to look at, hey, is using water cooled a waste of water? Should we consider going to an air-cooled system rather than a water-cooled system, especially in these types of climates where uh, water availability may be a little more limited. So they looked at a sample data center, steady 1500 kilowatt cooling load. They looked at the difference between a standard efficient water cooled system and a standard efficient air cooled system. And if you look at just the power consumption, um, I think this one makes logical sense. We've discussed this previously, but there's relatively pretty much an almost three to one ratio across the board on this on the chiller plant load. Now when you look at the water use holistically here, so the graph on the left, it might be a little bit hard to read, I can read through it. Basically it, it adds up water usage at the site as well as the water usage at the power plant for these regional locations. So 
So the first one on the left there is Denver. The um, dark blue represents the air cool system, and the light blue represents water cool. So Denver looks roughly like a 20% water savings by going to water cool. When you go to Phoenix, it changes drastically. And then when you go to Los Angeles, which is the third set of bars there, uh, looks like it's about double the water usage. As you move towards the right, the right graph, that is simply the electricity consumed. So that one's a little more logical. So the, the graph on the left is what people don't quite understand all the time as far as water consumption. Now if we just looked at the actual numbers, this is what the numbers were behind those graphs that I just showed. And you can see the differences there at the bottom, just the percent of water use reduction. Uh, with Denver, 22%. Phoenix, 59%, and Los Angeles, 23.5%. So obviously this is very dependent on the water that you have, um, or the power that you have available to you on a regional basis. Um, but again, even if you have renewables available to you, um, there's only so much of that to go around. So it's always good to save energy. That way others can have a, a slice of that small 